and welcome to The Writing Forge, where we discuss tips and tricks for honing your writing. I'm Bonnie. I'm Miranda. And we're your hosts. Let's Let's get get into it. it. Hello and welcome to The Writing Forge. I'm Miranda. I'm Bonnie. And today we are going to be talking about reading widely with our guest, Richard Binder. Did I say that right? Bender? Yes, you did. Okay. And so, uh, Richard, how did you get into the writing industry? Well, you know, I've been a massive reader my whole life. I have an older sister who was an award-winning teacher. She eventually became a professor and dean at a teacher's college. But she taught me to read by the time I was three. Oh, wow. And so I was been a crazed reader all my life. I did 239 book reports in second grade. Oh, my nice. goodness. You know, so I have read a lot. And I think that's done more than anything else to help me develop as a writer. I agree. That is, I probably is huge. I own 3,000 books, all of which have been read. Nice. Well, you may, it reminded me of our episode on Bookstagram. You probably would be well prepared to do a lot of pictures of books then if you own that many. (laughs) (laughs) Well, one of the things we wanted to talk about today is um, reading in a lot of different genres. And you you mentioned before we started recording that you have a memoir and you have this, would you call it a cookbook? Well, kind of a cookbook because there's recipes in it, but it's called Wild Winemaking. And I've been a home winemaker for 35 years. I've made more than 150 different wines, only four of them from grapes. Nice. Last one from grapes is called Mary Jane's Grape, (laughs) Colorado special wine. There you go. But this book just landed me my dream job. A winery up in Fort Collins was looking for an assistant winemaker. And so I wrote to him and I said, I've been a home winemaker for 35 years. If you want a resume, look at this book. <laughs> and I heard from them in 30 minutes asking for a meeting. Yay. That's awesome. And I blew them away. <laughs> <laughs> They've actually ordered a dozen stainless steel fermentation tanks strictly to make wines with my recipes. That is awesome. I'll be working at the wine read some this afternoon before the event I have to go to tonight. So what are the genres of your other books? Well, they're all nonfiction. Okay. Um, My first two books were actually bonsai books. I had a bonsai uh, tree nursery for more than 20 years. I've sold a million dollars worth of bonsai I've created. I sold to the Bellagio in Vegas. Oh, wow. I have an orange bonsai tree in my bedroom right now that has 70 ripe oranges on it. Nice. And so those were my first two. And then with my long history in, in winemaking, uh, this is was number three, wild winemaking. And there's even a chapter in there on cannabis wines that I've been making since 2006. Shh. <laughs> Statute of limitations. Statute of limitations. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm not too worried. But what they're excited about at the winery is I ferment citrus and hot peppers together. Hmm. And we're going to start a whole line of wines from my recipe. So that's pretty exciting. I mean, jalapeno beer is pretty good. So I imagine well, wine must be even better. better. Exactly. And much better. What, when I met the owner... Um, New owner at the winery, he's actually president and CEO of Citywide Banks and bought this winery. Mm -hmm. And he's a red wine guy. And I poured him a glass of 2013 Kumquat Kung Pao. Interesting. And he took one sip and said, wow. (laughs) So it's been fun. So do you mix your book genres like you mix your wines? Like how do you... Like reading widely is important and we'll get to why later. And so like what what are the genres that you like to read the most? Like where most of my reading is either science fiction or nonfiction. Okay. Um and it's with science fiction, especially I like what they call hard mm-hmm. science fiction that's got science in it. 
You know, I always considered myself a scientist. You know, that's what I went went to college for and said I, I don't have any artistic ability. And then I ended up selling a million dollars worth of my own art. There you go. Well, maybe so that's a good way to start our conversation. So you've established for fun, you like to read science fiction. Yes. How about you, Miranda? Um, I also like to read science fiction. I like to read fantasy. Um, and I will detour into other genres semi-frequently. Uh, general fiction is always good. Uh, romance on occasion, like, although I don't strictly read romance, I actually, <laughs> I like my main genre, but there must be a good romance B story. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I don't actually like reading a lot of romance Straight for romance, romance sake. Yeah. Um, how about you, Bonnie? What are your favorite genres? Yeah, I'm definitely a fantasy. That's like, if I'm going to read something for fun, that's what I pull up. Science fiction too, but like fantasy is first and then... And then science fiction. Okay, so we've established what we like to read. But one of our important questions is, why is it important to read in other genres? Well, because you can see other writing styles. And one of the things I've done in the last few years, anyway, is make myself read books by some of the real big popular writers out there, like the ones that you see their, their novels at the grocery store. Yeah, you know? the airport. And yeah, and it's not really my preferred reading, seeing how other writers write. Although it's different because, you know, they're all writing, you know, fiction, you know, mm -hmm. writing right, novels. And, not. and I'm not, you know, although I write some interesting stuff that's similar. Like some of mine is what I call creative nonfiction, yeah, yeah, yeah. like mm -hmm. it, especially in my memoir where I'm telling it's essays about things I've done in my life, like the time I spent with Timothy Leary. <laughs> You can definitely pick up, yeah, if you're but writing you, nonfiction, there are skills. And, and I think it goes the other way, too. Like, if you're writing fiction, you can definitely pick up skills from nonfiction that you read. Right. And I figure that, that reading more fiction, especially by some of the top authors out there, will help me craft the essays that I'm working mm -hmm. on right now as collections of essays about things in my life and the things I do, because I've got a lot there. Yeah. And so what kind of things do you pick up from reading other authors' work? Is it like the voice? Is it the style? Is it description? Is it layout? Is it... Well, it, it is the description a lot, you know, mm -hmm. and how they describe things and the uh, interactions between people and dialogue, although there's not a lot of dialogue in what <laughs> I write, mm -hmm. you know. There is some when I'm interacting with other people and telling, you know, true stories about the stuff I've done in my life. Yeah, because... You know? I know. I know when I read other genres, um, I'm looking for what they call tropes. So I'm looking for like hallmarks of the different genres. So like, what is it that Westerns do? What is it that romance does? What is it that, you know, sci-fi does? What is it that horror does? So I try to pick up either the tropes or some of the techniques like horror does suspense, like nobody's business most mm -hmm. of the time. Um, and thriller does suspense, but in a different way, like horror is atmospheric, but suspense is all in the pacing. And so I know. And, and mystery books. Yes. Do, do the, a similar kind of thing. How do you, how do you bury the clues? How do you. Uh -huh. Which is important for anything that you're writing, because really any book is kind of like you're solving a mystery. It's just maybe right. not a murder. It's, you, you know, know, and, and it's how the same kind of thing, like how they create um, tension. And then resolve it at the end. Even in writing nonfiction, you want to do that at the beginning. Like I'm writing an essay, you want to bring up something at the beginning that you tie back into at the end of what you're writing. So mm -hmm. you, you come full circle and you bring it all together. Well, and humor does that too. Mm. Yeah. Like they'll, they'll kind of start a joke and then drop it in different places along the way and then finish off with the same joke. Well, and I feel like that's a good example. Like you were saying, Miranda, that you like to read things that have a romance subplot. Like, I like to read things that are funny. Like, I don't read straight up comedies, but I like to read fantasy books that have funny things in them. And so, you know, if I'm going to write something like that, then maybe I should read some straight up comedies in order to see um, how they build the jokes and 
um, make people laugh if that's something I want to do. And the more widely you read, I think the, it can only help you as a writer to see all kinds of different styles and how other people approach things. And I was just thinking, like, maybe even especially if you're self-publishing. Now, you are you self-published or? I, my first three are traditional. Okay. I've and got right. an agent in New York. Mm-hmm. And my fourth book is self-published. Looks like I told you my agent. refused to even try to sell it you know which I think is her mistake (laughs) well I like that because then you have the the experience on both sides yes um and I was just thinking because Miranda brought up format and how I I recently I don't read a lot actually I've been reading more and more biographies and I read two different biographies of the same person um and it was really interesting to compare like the physical format of the book yeah. And um, things that I liked or didn't like. And if I were to self-publish something, you know, am I going to do this thing? Am I going to do that thing? And How do you find uh, books that help you grow? Or do you even look for books that help you grow? Like, do you specifically seek out books? Like, there's a skill in my writing and in my craft that I want to master. And so do you look out books, look out for books to do that? Or do you just absorb it as you well, go along the way? I pretty much absorb it along the way. At, at least at this point, earlier in my writing career, I did a lot of reading about writing and the, you know, and the business of writing. And I actually got started by taking a class at CSU in magazine article writing. Okay. And as a result of that class, I got my first magazine article in Horticulture Magazine, which is about creating bonsai trees out of herbs. And that magazine article eventually got me my first book deal and my first book. You know, and that's an important thing, too, for somebody that wants to become a writer. You need published clips, Mm. especially if you want to try to get an agent and go the traditional route. And published clips can come anywhere, even if you're writing for free as an editorial column in a local paper. You know, I wrote an outdoors column for a little monthly newspaper in Fort Collins for a while, And it's funny, right when I got accepted to do that uh, story for Horticulture magazine, at the same time, the Fort Collins, Colorado newspaper was looking for some freelance writers. And after I'd been accepted at Horticulture, but before that story came out, I actually did eight stories for the Colorado one, and I got paid. It was only like ten or fifteen dollars a story. But hey, you know, it's, it's a, a start. start. <laughs> yeah, but some of them were with pictures on the front page of uh, of one of the sections of the paper. So that gave me some published clips to get going in the business. So I was nice. thinking we talked about you know reading lots of different genres. We sort of skipped over the. But another thing that I think is super important, which is reading a lot in the genre you want to write or the genre right. you want to publish in. So let's talk about that. Why is it important to read a lot of books in the genre you want to write? Well, because you have to understand what's going to appeal to people in the genre you want to write, mm. you know, and see the style that other people are doing. And especially for a specific to- topic, if it's similar to what you want to write, you want to see what's already out there. So that you can do something that complements it, that will also interest people, but that you're not directly copying something that's already out there. Yeah, you want similar but different. Right. And then, and if you have an idea, you can see if there's other books out there that are similar or on similar topics and if they've done well. Very true. And sort of see how to do your own take on it, too. Uh-huh. I feel like sometimes people are like, well, I don't want to read in the genre that I'm writing in because I want to be... I want to have a fresh voice. I don't want to be influenced too much by the other people. But I, I, you can't really know, you know, what you're being influenced by or not unless you know what's in there. Well, and it can be a good influence if you yeah. learn things mm-hmm. from that. Well, and I was going to say I did that first writing out. Like I didn't avoid it completely. I just was young and was not super <laughs> familiar with the fantasy genre, like had read Lord of the Rings and some of the other uh, big books in the genre uh, and then started writing my own story and was like, hey, I came up with this totally unique idea. <laughs> and everyone went, no, honey, there's like four of <laughs> there's like four or five major series that feature this story type. And so like I think it's important just so that way you do know that there's four or five of that story type out there. And so like that doesn't mean you can't still publish that right. story. It just means you have to find your angle. Um Yeah, I think that's another important like it's okay to write 
you know, uh, I can't even think of examples right now, but, you know, similar kinds of stories because everyone's going to do it differently. So the way that mm-hmm. you do, oh, what was the example I heard? You know, like a, an orphaned wizard named Harry. You know, you've got Harry Potter, you've got the Dresden Files. Those are very different books. <laughs> <laughs> but you could say they came from the same, you know. Prompt. Yeah. <laughs> the same word. prompt. Uh, Bonnie, you are an editor, yes, um, first and foremost. Mm-hmm. Do you read in the genres that you edit? And then is it important to read widely as an editor? Yeah. I mean, definitely reading a lot of different genres. And usually often, not all the time, but if there's a, a genre I'm not really familiar with that I'm helping someone edit, then I'll be like, what What were your influences? Like, what's your favorite book? I remember I was editing something and he was like Dan Brown and I was like it's been a while since I read Dan Brown let me go pick up another Dan Brown and and then, and then as I was doing that I was able to see ah okay I understand what this this author that I'm trying to help is doing he's trying to copy this thing he didn't quite do it that way so here's a way that that I can help him do it better so I think that's definitely helpful and 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 that is one thing that I pretty much always ask my clients now is what what books inspire you what books are you you know your comp titles if you will um, because that's, I think it's important for them to know it too, um, yes. as they're going to try to sell things. And it's important for me to know so I can help them be similar, but not the same, you know. I was going to say, actually, as a traditionally published author, comp titles are like pretty key. Do you come up with your own comp titles or is that something that your agent does to help sell it to the different publishing that's houses? That's what the agent does. <laughs> the agent does Although that? I put, you know, working with her, I put some of those in the book proposal right. that I prepared for her to take out and market. Okay. And actually my, my first book, I didn't have an agent yet, and I developed a proposal and actually sold it with a cash advance on my own and then used that success to get an agent who sold my next two books. That's... That's awesome. So how did you find your comp titles? Like, did you already have, did you already have your book written and then you went out and looked for people who you could riff off well, of? So for, for our audience who's listening and might not be sure, our comp titles are comparable titles, I believe. I think yeah. that's what it's short for. Um, and it's books that are supposed to be similar to yours where you can take pieces and parts in order to help sell it to someone else so like well uh, it's actually part in the traditional route it's part of putting together a book proposal Mm. because you want to say you know what I want to write is similar to these books and these books were successful (laughs) but here is where my book is different from them but should also be successful to the same audience you know, so that's bef- really before the book is written. It's part of the proposal to, to sell it traditionally to compare it to similar titles. And so how do you how do you find those titles? Well, you just Google them or go on Amazon <laughs> and look, you know, <laughs> you, you know, at this at this point, you know, uh, you can go to Amazon and say, like, winemaking books for like if I wanted similar to this and you'll get a whole raft of stuff, you know, and almost anything you put in. Of course, my first ones were um, really before the internet, Mm -hmm. you know, I uh, typed out that first one (laughs) on on a, on my, well, I guess it was internet, but it was my first computer, a Mac plus. Was it, was and, it one of the colored ones? No. No. <laughs> no. And I used to say, oh, my God, like moving from a, a manual typewriter to computer is like jumping on a jet plane. Because <laughs> <laughs> oh. it made writing so much easier. Nice. <laughs> I was going to say, so you Googled or Amazoned, is that a verb now, yeah. um, the titles of, of comp. Then did you go read those books? Some of them I did, yeah, or at least uh, looked over them if I didn't read the whole word thing but yeah. I have I have this mental compulsion if I pick up a book it is very hard for me to put it away if I don't <laughs> read it to the end yeah. even if I'm not particularly happy with the book I have that problem too there's only a few that I've put down and sometimes I'm like why didn't I put this down <laughs> <sooner>? <laughs> but um some books surprise you. Some books... It's true. It's true. So maybe that's it. It's just I have this hope that it'll... And sometimes it, even with science fiction books with authors that I like, it might take me 75 or 100 pages to where I'm happy and feeling good about what I'm reading. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have that slow burn start sometimes, yeah. I was just thinking too, I don't know why because it's not at all related, but... Um, 
I was thinking of children's books. I think it's really important for people who want to write children's books to go to a bookstore and pull a bunch of children. And that's that maybe that's a neat because they're short, so you could uh-huh. literally read the whole thing. You could pull out a dozen books and read them all. But I think you can do the same kind of thing no matter what genre you're writing in. Go pull off of Barnes and Noble because then you know it's probably selling, and and just compare them. And while you're reading widely, what? Do you, what should you pay attention to? Like, do you read just for fun? Um, or are you reading for a purpose? Or, um, or do you switch it up? Are, are some books purely for enjoyment and then other books are research related concerning your next work or? Yeah, although um, most of my reading is for fun. <laughs> um, reading is fun. And it's like, I'm, even though I'm a nonfiction writer, mm-hmm. I'm not reading to get information about what my next topic is going to be because my topic is essentially my life and the things I do, (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know, and so it's all up here in my head. (laughs) The problem is making myself sit down and do it because I've got about four or five books in my head. A hundred percent. That is, (laughs) that is the struggle. (laughs) That's why I'm not a writer because I don't have that problem. Mm-hmm. I can help other people who make their ideas come out. But so, because I know um, there was, I was having an issue with my first chapter uh, of my mm-hmm. manuscript, and so I actually went around and I plucked, I think, four or five books off of my own bookshelf because through there, might as well use them. <laughs> and I read the first chapter of each one of the books that I pulled that were similar to what I was writing, and just saw how everyone introduced their books. Um, I think it was specifically first chapters of the, of the author's first published book. Hmm. Um, mainly because I was feeling down on myself. And it's like, no, <laughs> see, see, look, <laughs> they do get better as they go along. You shouldn't compare your first book to someone's 10th book. And so, right. but I was reading with a purpose, but I don't always do that. How about, how about you, Bonnie? When you read, is it for fun or for purpose? And how do you differentiate between the two? I mean, I usually like I just read for fun, like like that case of Dan Brown or whatever. But I was still it was still fun to read it. Um, And I don't know, I think in some ways, maybe maybe I'm a little different from most people in that I can read for fun and still see problems along the way. Um, not problems, that sounds wrong, but you know, things that to, to improve upon. Yeah. Yes, you know, and it I, doesn't, it doesn't ruin my enjoyment of the book. I, and I see some of that too. And some of the stuff I read, especially if I'm reading a, uh, self-published science fiction <laughs> book, uh, you know, yeah. where a little misspelling or, or to be fair, that happens choice. in traditionally published books. It does. It does. And. I feel like I have developed a really good eye for that because I catch that kind of stuff all the time. And I think that comes from having read thousands of books. Just sheer experience. You know, just sheer experience, seeing that. And, like, I don't need much style editing in what I write. You know, I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm not pumping out reams of stuff <laughs> and then having to go back and work it over. If I get a thousand words written in a day where I'm working at it seriously, I'm doing well. I think that's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. That, that's real good, you know. And that usually doesn't happen unless I'm under a deadline. <laughs> <laughs> Deadlines are very handy in that way. They are. Yeah. I will say when I'm reading, um, if something makes me pause, mm-hmm. like if there's... Yes. If it's an aha moment or if it's like, dang, that was like, like I actually jumped. Like (laughs) I will go back and I'll be like, wait, how did they make me jump? I'm reading words. There wasn't a loud noise. There wasn't uh, there. There, you know, it wasn't like a jump scare in a movie. So how did you how did you make me jump or I'll laugh and I'll be like, wait, why was that funny? (laughs) Like, I mean, that was funny. That was hilarious. But like, was it the timing? Was it the pacing? And so I like that. That's like a, a, a way to make yourself. Yeah, you stop. So so really stop and go back and look at it. Um. I think another thing, too, if you don't want to, like, interrupt your reading in the middle of it is something I've started doing lately is doing a lot of Goodreads reviews um, because it makes me think about the book. Even though I wasn't necessarily thinking about it while I was reading it, Mm -hmm. um, as I'm thinking back on it the next day or two, I'm like, oh, yeah, they did this thing really well. I wasn't even actively paying attention to it. But since I'm trying to find things to write about in the review, um, it makes me realize things that, that are useful and that I could apply myself. 
Yeah, I haven't really done much in the way of reviews, even though I probably should. <laughs> but it's because I've got so much I need to write on my own, and it's hard to make myself sit down and do it. Like, I'm about 11,000 words into my next uh, it, the next edition of my memoir, but that's about 11 or 12 essays. Mm. And they even include things like I published a, a model of consciousness I developed at a scientific conference. Oh, wow. And so I kind of edited that, took out the, all the footnotes and, and, and stuff to make it more suitable for an essay to read. And that one's published in the first edition of my memoir. But it's also got stories about frogging and <laughs> crawdads because my social media handle is Hillbilly Savant. <laughs> and that's a title given to me by a Harvard professor. <laughs> who gives titles to significant people in his life. And I'm a Missouri hillbilly. Nice. But I was also a National Merit Scholar member of Mensa. Fantastic. You know? And uh, so the hillbilly savant seems to fit. <laughs> it's a nice juxtaposition. It is, and it gets people's attention yeah. when they hear that. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of like my top hat. Yeah, <laughs> which our listeners can't see, but he has quite an epic top hat. I do, and you know, the thing is, I, I'm, I'm really known for that. I, I spent the last two days working at the NoCo Hemp Expo, and the first day I didn't wear a top hat, and I got <laughs> harassed. <laughs> I, get, I, I do, I hear that when I don't wear it. And so the two previous weekends, I was just out seeing friends play music, and I was dressed to go out, so I was wearing my top hat, and both weekends, I had people yell at me, complimenting my top hat, <laughs> and I stopped to talk to them. And both of those weekends, I sold two copies of my book to people that yelled out about my hey. top hat, and I stopped to talk to them. One time, I was walking by a bar, and <laughs> actually on my way to my car, I was going to go home. And this beautiful young lady ran out of the bar and said, I love your top hat. If you'll come in and talk to me, I'll buy you a drink. I said, okay. <laughs> Twist my rubber arm. And so she wanted to know who I was and what I was doing. I started talking about my winemaking book. And the girl at the table behind us said, wine? What's that? And she ended up buying a book to give as a gift to a friend. So over two weekends, I sold four books just from people complimenting me on my top hat. Marketing tip. Yeah. It's a, uniquely. It's a brand. It's a part of my brand. Branding. Yeah. You know, you'll see it on my uh, business card. I was going to say, I think there's definitely a lot of object lessons in there. And I was thinking, too, like, you could think of the hat as like a trope, right? And the things that you expect to see. And, you know, and, it, and if you and don't it see it, people me. get upset. Yeah, exactly. The, the, hop, the, top, the, the top hat fits me and it looks good on me, you know, because I've got, you know, long. I like to pretend my hair is still blonde. <laughs> <laughs> in my mind, mm -hmm. anyway. You know, but I see people that look at me and they go, Leon Russell? <laughs> Tom Petty? <laughs> I said, no, I taught them everything they know. <laughs> uh, well, it has been fun talking to you, Richard. Unfortunately, we are out of time for today. And so we usually finish up with a question for our listeners, Bonnie. Yeah, so I was thinking for our listeners to... Um, think of think of what genre you usually read and what's a genre you don't usually read and 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 tell us and maybe we can give you some suggestions to read in that genre and our, our you know our community can help each other out so put that uh in the social links down uh in the description and we will see you next time That's all the time we have for today, folks. Thanks for joining us for this episode of The Writing Forge, an NCW podcast brought to you by Nagano Press. To learn more about The Writing Forge and our parent company, Northern Colorado Writers, be sure to check out our website at northerncoloradowriters.com. Check out our social links in the description. You can subscribe to The Writing Forge wherever podcasts are aired. If you like this episode, you'd really help us out by rating and reviewing. If you're looking for more informational writing content, be sure to become an NCW member. Stay sharp, my friends. 